Okay, welcome to part two of us reacting to uh, Ray Dalio's video about principles for dealing with the changing world order. Uh, in part one, we learned about his sort of framework for predicting the idea that something is going down and something else is coming up. And then he was talking about how the conflicts when these two lines meet, yes. typically military style conflicts. Uh, and then he also talked about like a little bit about money and how that was like. So I think we ended by talking about his, like, his his way of trying to see how the next thing will come. And I think the limitation was that because we are humans, our lifetime is too short sometimes to see beyond like, a span of 100 years. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I right. mean, we are humans. I yeah. mean, that's, that's for that sure. That's true, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, uh, I think there are many times in the, uh, you know, like in ancient Europe, some of the things that happening today already mm. happened then. Yeah. It's just that maybe you just can't be bothered to go and go and find out. I think yeah. most people will, won't be bothered to go and find out. Yeah, so he's hinging our interest in like finance and then trying to throw it towards history a little bit, which yep. I think is always good. Because you're always a fan of history. Yes. Before even this financial stuff, right? Yes. And, and also very puzzling. He, he keeps plugging his book. Okay, but, uh, but I guess, yeah, it's, it's, it but I guess it's not to make money. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's, let's play. Because he doesn't need it. Yeah, he does. Shout out to you, Ray. And the cycle begins again. As I looked back, I saw that these cause and effect relationships drove the cycles of rises and New York accent. All the way back to so. the Roman I don't Empire. Know. I Bernie saw Sanders has the this. stories yeah. of each one of these cycles so Wall Street blended accent. together with others before, during, and after in the same way as each individual story wow. blends with others to make the epic 500 wow. year story that is our collective history. And like human life cycles, no two are exactly the same, but most are similar. They're driven by logical cause and effect relationships that progress through stages from birth, birth to strength and maturity, to weakness and inevitably decline. However, that's like saying a person's life cycle takes 80 years on average without recognizing that many are much shorter and many are longer. While age can be a good indicator of future longevity, a better way is to look at health indicators. One can do that with empires and their vital signs too. So which empire smoke? I found that by watching the indicators of power change, I was able to see what stage a country was in, which helped me to anticipate what was likely to come next. Now, I'll take you through the big cycle in more detail. Give me 20 minutes and I'll give you the last 500 years of history and show you the similar patterns across the Dutch, British, US and Chinese empires. Wow. So he's saying this was coming years years of mm. big cycles. I think he has always been very upfront about his interest in China. Because it's the next world order. I'm he going thinks to describe the typical cycle by dividing it into three phases. The rise, the top, and the decline. The rise. Successful new orders that rise both internal and Dutch. external, are typically started by powerful revolutionary leaders doing four Quite things. Enemies. First, they win power by gaining more support than the opposition. <laughs> He's in Second, they consolidate power by converting, weakening, or eliminating the opposition so they don't stand in their way. Third, they establish systems and institutions that make the country work well. And fourth, they pick their successors well, or create systems that do that. Because a great empire requires many great leaders over I was thinking several of LKY generations. When that whole At thing this stage, soon after winning happened. the fight, there is typically a period of peace and growing prosperity because the leadership is clearly dominant and has broad support, so no one wants to fight it. During this phase, leaders within the country have to design an excellent system to raise the country's wealth and power. First and foremost, to be great, they must have strong it's, it's, education, which is not just teaching Singapore. knowledge and skills, uh, but yeah. also a, a strong character, a tiny civility, yeah. and work ethic. These are typically this taught in the cube. family, schools, and religious institutions. That provides a healthy respect for rules and laws, order within society, low corruption, and enables them to unite behind a common purpose and work well together. 
As they do this, they increasingly shift from producing basic products to innovating and inventing new technology. They move out of value chain. For example, the Dutch rose to defeat the Habsburg Empire. Habsburg. And become superbly educated. They became so inventive that they came up with a quarter of all major inventions in the a world. Quarter. The most important of which was the invention of ships that could travel around the world wow. to collect great riches. I didn't know that and was the a invention Dutch of thing. capitalism as we know it today to finance those voyages. Oh my goodness. They, like all leading empires, enhanced their thinking by being open to the best thinking in the world. As a result, the people in the country become more productive and more competitive in world markets, which shows up in their growing economic output and oh, the rising share of world trade. So good. You can see this happening now as the U.S. and China are roughly H comparable in both their economic outputs and their shares of world trade. Z -Skull. Do you know it? As countries trade more globally, they must protect their trade and their foreign country. interests from attack, How so long? they develop great military strength. If done well, this virtuous cycle leads to strong income growth, which can be used to finance investments in education, infrastructure, and research and development. They must also develop systems to incentivize and empower those that have the ability to make or take wealth. In all of these cases, the most successful empires used a capitalist approach to develop productive entrepreneurs. Even China, which is run by the Chinese Communist Party, used a form of this capitalist approach. Yep. Malaysia is probably one of these people who sees it. Deng Xiaoping, no, when asked say, about this, doesn't matter. said, it doesn't matter if it's a white cat or a black cat, as long as it catches mice. And it's glorious to be rich. Wow. To do this well, they must develop their capital markets. Most important. Early game China focused on getting rich first. Bond yep. Then and stock markets. The moral stuff. That allows later. people to convert later. their savings into investments to fund invention and development and share in the successes of those who make great things happen. Siva. The Dutch created the first publicly listed company, the Dutch East India mm. Company, and the first stock market to fund it, which were integral parts of the system that you know, produced not US. massive no, wealth no and power. As a natural consequence, the greatest empires developed the world's leading financial centers for attracting and distributing the world's capital. Amsterdam was the world's financial center when the Dutch were Wow, I had no idea. London, when the British were on top. New York is now. Hmm. And China is quickly developing its financial centers. Most importantly, the capitalists, the governments, and the military must work together. Not only did the Dutch work well together, they were one and the same. The Dutch East India Company was granted a trade monopoly from the government and had its own officially sanctioned military to go out into the My global goodness. markets to yeah. make and take wealth. The British and followed yet with the fell. British East yeah. India Company so and had a similar a coordination of their right. government, business, and us. military operations. The U.S. military industrial complex. I think to our parents, suit, our grandparents, as does the Chinese right? system. Yeah, like today. the British will never fall. Yeah. But everything falls. And yeah, they did. Yeah. As the country becomes the largest international trading empire, its transactions can be paid with its currency, making it the preferred global medium of exchange. And because their currency is so widely accepted and frequently used, people around the world want to save in it. Huh. Making it, it was the, the reserve currency storehold mm. of wealth, and thus the world's oh my leading goodness. reserve I didn't know the currency. Dutch used to be. What? The guilder was the world's main reserve currency when the Dutch led world trade. The pound was when the British led, and the dollar has been mm. since the U.S. led. Naturally, China's currency is increasingly being used as a reserve currency. 
Is it? Having a reserve currency enables the empire to borrow more him, than yeah. other countries. So. So what do we do? It's very really valuable. <laughs> yeah, it's very really valuable. That advantage is huge. Think about it. People all over the world are eager no, to save and hence yeah. lend yeah. back yeah. their currency to the empire. One copy of Countries the historic world currency don't have that. We don't have one. And when the empire runs out of its world. own money, remember the United States in 1971? Mm. They can always print more. Mm. The it's exorbitant sweating. privilege afforded by the empire's reserve currency leads borrowing to increase and the beginning of a financial bubble. This series of cause and effect relationships leading to mutually supportive financial, political, and military powers bolstered by the borrowing power of a reserve currency have gone together since history began to be recorded. All the empires that became the most powerful in the world followed this oh path goodness. to the top. Rule. While in the top phase, most of these strengths are sustained, embedded within the fruits of their success are the seeds of their decline. As a rule, as people in these rich and powerful countries earn more, that makes them more expensive and less competitive relative to people in other countries who are willing to work for less. Mm. At the same time, people in other countries naturally copy the methods and technologies of the leading power, which further reduces the leading power's competitiveness. For example, British shipbuilders had less expensive workers than Dutch shipbuilders. Mm. So they hired so Dutch so. designers to design better ships mm. that were built by less expensive Design in California, made in China. Making them more Apple, competitive, right? which led the British to rise and the Dutch to decline. Also, as people become richer, they tend not to work as hard. They enjoy more leisure, I mean, the finer and less true, true, things yeah. in life, and at the uh, assumption by being generation. Values change from generation to generation during the rise to the top, from those who had to fight to achieve wealth and power to those who inherited. Gross. <laughs> They're less battle hardened, steeped in luxuries, and accustomed to the easy life, which makes them more vulnerable to challenges. They're vulnerable. <laughs> Yeah, actually what I fear for uh, Singapore, Singapore yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's happening and in, in the, the Europeans right now the the And some Americans Yep Not all, but some Were yeah. such high prosperity periods like this As people get used to doing well They increasingly bet on the good times continuing mm. And borrow money to do that Which grows into keep financial up the bubbles Naturally, risk going financial on. gains come unevenly, so the wealth gap grows. Wealth gaps are self-reinforcing because rich people use their greater resources to reinforce their powers. For example, they give greater privileges to their children, like better education, give my children and they influence the political yeah. system to their advantage. This causes the gaps in values, politics, and opportunities to grow between the rich haves and the poor have-nots. What the? Those who are less well-off feel the system is unfair, so resentments grow. But as long as the living standards of most people are still rising, these gaps and resentments don't boil over into conflict. Having the world's reserve currency inevitably leads to borrowing excessively and contributes to the country building up large debts with foreign lenders. While this boosts spending power over the short term, it weakens the country's financial health and weakens the currency over the long term. In other words, when borrowing and spending are strong, the empire appears very strong, but its finances are in fact being weakened. The borrowing sustains the country's power beyond its fundamentals by financing both domestic overconsumption mm. and international military conflicts required to maintain the empire. Not familiar. Inevitably, mm. the cost of maintaining and defending the empire becomes greater than the revenue it brings. So, so having an empire becomes unprofitable. 
For example, the Dutch Empire overextended around the world and fought war I love and the increasingly expensive war with the British and other European powers. I think it's quite audience American. It's small. The British Empire similarly became massive, bureaucratic, and lost its competitive yeah. advantages. So we know that it's all Particularly yeah, Germany, mom and dad. sword, leading to an increasingly expensive arms race and world war. The U.S. has spent about eight trillion dollars on foreign wars and their consequences since September 11, and trillions more for other oh, military like operations rules. and for supporting military bases Operation, in 70 yeah. countries. Uh -huh. Operations. And it still isn't spending enough to support its military competition with China, yeah, China in the right. In this cycle, the richer countries eventually get deeper into debt by borrowing from poor countries that save more. It's one of the early signs of a wealth of power shift. This started in the United States in the 1980s, when it had a per capita income 40 times that of China's and started borrowing from Chinese who wanted to save in dollars because the dollar was the world's reserve currency. Similarly, the British borrowed a lot of money from its much poorer economies, and the Dutch did the same at their time. If the empire begins to run out of new lenders, those holding their currency begin to look to sell and get out rather than to buy, save, lend, and get in. and the strength of the empire begins to decline. The decline. Well, I think we stop here. The mm. decline. Oh, that was amazing. I love the perspective on the, the Dutch empire because I really don't know much about that. I mean, the American empire, we are seeing it now, today what's happening. And we've also learned a lot in history about the time where the British colonies were here and then their eventual sort of fate, right? Actually, if you study like the Southeast Asia history, yeah, to this, yeah. I think you'll see that uh, before the British came here, yeah. the Dutch were here. Is it? Yeah, I, yeah, know, yeah. I have no idea. Like, like if I'm not wrong, I think Malacca was oh, yeah. owned by yeah. the Dutch, right? Uh, so were the people in Indonesia. I think Indonesia was known as Batavia back then. I see. Yeah, and after that, the British established a stronghold in Singapore and Penang. Mm. And then somehow, mm. I don't know what happened. I can't also, remember. Actually, already. we can see it because I, I do remember like, going to some places in Malacca and there are obvious Dutch influences. Yep. Uh, in some areas, the Portuguese as well. Oh, you yes. know, like the Portuguese egg tart and stuff. They, these are cultural remnants that we can still see today, even yep. though we were not so familiar with them. So actually, some of these things still linger now. Yep. They're right, actually. I think if you look close enough, you can, you can see some, some traces. Yeah, I, I love the video so far. It's, it's great. I also love the, the whole thing about China. Because it doesn't seem evident to me now also. But he is looking at the big picture stuff. He but he is looking at the big picture yep. more than I ever can. Yeah. And I wonder also like if there are red herrings. Like for example, uh, when the American Empire came out, it seemed like it might be America or somebody else. Or maybe there was another somebody else. Then people might have thought that that would have been the next thing. But actually America went up. You know, so to Ray Dalio, like how certain is is he that China is the next thing? Yeah. Because from now where we see it, we hear a lot of things coming out of China that is good, but also a lot of things that are not good. Like that there's a lot of like problems internally, like the whole Heng Da, the Evergrande collapse, you mm. know? So actually in the 80s, yeah. Japan was supposed to be the next power. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Engineering wise, the manufacturing. Yep. And yep. economy grew faster than the US's. Yeah. And after that, like people predicted that Japan will eventually become the world power. Mm. But of course, mm. in the end, we know what happened. Like, like America prevailed. Yeah. So, but ultimately, America had a big part to play in Japan's demise, like the economy. From what I know, is like I think they kind of intentionally starved the Japanese economy, and became more inward looking for a while. So they preserved their lead. Who who became inward looking? Americans. Yeah, Americans like protected their jobs and their industry lah. Oh, by making cars to compete with the Japanese. I think not just uh not just like cars, but I think uh -huh. they uh I can't remember, but I think they put in regulation that made Japanese 
products less competitive I see, I see. in the con- in the country right, right, right. or because they, they had that reserve currency power la. Yeah. And right. after they they basically messed with Japan. La. And see, then Japan ended in, uh, entered this uh, crazy crazy spiral. Yes, yes. Which it which then it they stall, la, right? I mean yeah. like, some 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 places in Japan you go there it feels like the eighties. Yeah. There's a charm about it, but it feels like also it's a remnant of like them being so strong back then, but then they somehow mm. stall. Like if you want to go like go see like the peak eighties, you go to Japan. Mm. Yes, yes, right. yes, yeah. I remember going to a hotel room in Japan. Yeah. You can smoke one. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's damn fancy. There's that vibe. But right? it's, like but it's the, 80s. Like the phone would be the big phone, you yeah. know. Then, then they call it Neo Tokyo, which is now also taking on a new sort of a spin on its own that is actually quite attractive to young people. Would you say it's like Americana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps, yeah. Right. Maybe that, that Miami it's, 80s yeah, vice yeah. city kind Maybe of thing. Very outlandish. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then. Economically, that might not refer to something that is that good. Yeah, right? exactly. Because like, sometimes I also like, we, we bemoan the lack of heritage stuff in Singapore. But sometimes the heritage stuff is a remnant of the past because there is not enough like, economic activity to justify tearing down a building and rebuilding it because the need for commerce or economic progress is so great there that it ca- just can't resist it. Because it costs money to upkeep heritage, right? Yep. So sometimes a lot of these things are left over because of a lack of... I suspect like economic activity. La. I think yes. And also because Singapore is a city. Yeah, it has to con- there's no rural, right? Yeah. I mean, Jap- Japan is small, but if Singapore is even smaller. Yeah, like I mean they can build they, they can have Osaka castle there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But only yeah. because they make money, but then they can build a nice city. Be. True, true, true. If we have a Singapore castle, yeah. we probably could keep it but at great opportunity cost. Yes, yes. Yeah, the Istana in town, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the value of that land yeah, it's, is it's a immense, lot. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, okay, one istana is fine, but imagine like 20 istanas. Yeah. I think. Uh, uh, Lim Jukang got one there, then the Chua Jukang got one. <laughs> yeah, I think the Chua Castle, the Lim Castle. I think that will be uh, them challenging. Yeah. Uh, but also, looking at the video, I could not help but relate a lot with, with Singapore. Mm. Like, I think Ray Dalio does speak some truth when he said that when. Uh, countries become more prosperous, the people generally want to work less. Yep. This is not necessarily a bad thing yep. because sometimes when you work less, you have more room for creativity yep. and whatsoever. Yep. The problem is is that if you work less and are also not creative, yep. then that's going to be a problem. Right. Right. Yep. If I mean, you either work smart or you work hard, yep. especially as a small state in Singapore. Right, right. So I feel like right now in Singapore, yeah. There's a lot of conversation about working less hard, yeah, and that is fine because yeah. I think uh, we have enough wealth to to kind of sustain for a while. Sustain for a while, but I, I think what is equally important is that we must realize that we need to start thinking of how to move out the value chain. Need to how need to figure out how to continue to earn more than our counterparts and charge more for our counterparts. Yeah, I feel like. Um, Decompression, which is like what happens when you don't work, right? Decompression is very powerful to leverage and to convert into even more creative and efficient productivity, right? Yeah. Because when you talk about efficient, it means doing more with less. So it's not just about doing all the time. Mm. It's about doing more and being more efficient as technology progresses to be able to keep up with it and moving up the value chain that you speak. Yeah. So I honestly, and I, I, I say this with all disclaimers that, that this is, there are a lot of exceptions to this, right? But I really feel like uh, with my limited time and experience working with Europe, the European culture sometimes embodies the very good side of this where they have very, very good work-life balance. Like yeah. A lot of these Scandinavian and European countries have like mandatory 9 to 5 things where they will shut the office. The doors will literally shut after a certain time of the lights will off. That's great. And, and when I went there, I was just amazed that when you go on the streets, like when they're like 6 o'clock, the bars are beginning to fill up already and there's activity everywhere and it, it's such an awesome culture that I love. But on the other hand also, right, I felt like through my personal experiences, disclaimering, right, I've also worked with uh, European counterparts who are not clearly not as hungry as I am and that has made it sometimes harder to work with them. They are a little bit less uh, agile when it comes to adopting something new. Just the ones you interacted with. Just the ones I've interacted with. I really feel like there's a cultural difference here, anecdotally speaking. And, and I've also related to a lot of people who also work uh, closely with Europeans and, and there's a tendency to echo what I've observed. 
and of, of course there are a lot of things about Europe that I love that is a consequence of them being able to have better work-life balance. For example, I always feel like European stuff is uh, more expensive, a little bit more boutique, but as an artist I love that stuff. And Americans typically are a bit more like still high quality but more manufactured uh, and, and I always like, like to buy European stuff as a result. I personally yes. patronage European stuff a lot. I think feel like, I mean in my experience, European stuff often like, it's very unique. Yeah. Like just the yeah. Europe only. Yeah, yeah. They made it like specifically for yes. that purpose. So it's very like bespoke. A lot yeah. of effort has gone yeah. over it. Very hard to ship here as well, you yeah. know? Yeah, Americans, pay a lot of money to ship here. Right? Americans they think of making money. Yeah, and they scale much better. But had you had to work closely with them, like really close. They're yeah, but colleagues, they were my superiors. Right, right, right. I mean, you know. I also think it's very important to realize that the Europeans have what they have. They owe a lot of it because of history yeah. instead of the current productivity. Their prosperity in the past. Uh, yeah. They're so prosperous that it can very last them several generations, right? Uh, like very innovative. I think some of the greatest inventions came out of Europe. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's uh something is very unrealistic for Singaporeans to yeah, well, we ex- to have. expect the European standard of living, European style benefits mm. when we do not have the historical advantage that they had. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine like in the 20th century in yeah. Singapore, yeah. if you were like a European expert here, you basically looked up to the locals and worshipped. Mm-hmm. That was the level of disparity. Because the arbitrage was such that just in terms of wealth, yeah. you are able to be much more prosperous yeah. than them. And right? for a very long time, yeah. Asian people were like NPCs in this, on the global yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can say, oh, there are people starving, where, then, oh, I don't know where, in Asia or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think now, now that's changing. Yeah. But I think the, the gap, historical gap, yeah. has been huge. Yeah. And I think it's important to realize that uh, Asia has also benefited from the decline of some of these uh, European, American powers. Not say decline, yeah. but we have taken some prosperity away from them. Yeah, yeah. because we, we are able to charge less. Yeah, or to to make the things. Yeah, but then now, but yeah. then now we are yeah. the Europeans. Yes, yes, that's that's what I was going to say. That, that yeah. you know, actually saying all this, we are not the the cheapest now. Like yeah. we are on our way up, and as a result of that, like regionally in Southeast Asia, mm. Singapore is surrounded by a lot more uh, countries that are hungrier than we are, and yeah. this could come down to a very strong competitive advantage that if young Singaporeans are not aware of can be quite bad. Uh. Like if you want to take on some of these narratives, you have to weigh very carefully and you must be very careful to convert your your currency advantage that you have now and your prosperous advantage and your ability to have a bit more of a chilled kind of life comparative to our ASEAN it's neighbors, neighbors right? yeah. to something productive. Take, take that prosperity and do something with it, not just sit on it. It's like, you know, sometimes People dislike rich kids who inherit money and do nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of like that. Uh, yeah. Singapore is pro- prosperous now. Yeah. What are we going to do with the wealth? Yeah. Are we going to, uh, you know, squander it? Yeah. Or are we going to try to grow it? Yeah. And, and I think if we don't have, as Singaporean like young people, not that we're young, but some of those younger than us, we sometimes don't have that. Uh, global or even regional perspective and that's very worrying to me and we are we are definitely aware that there are a lot of like, people in poverty in Singapore as well that live in like not very nice conditions but honestly you go and look at just go to Malaysia and see what their lower income people live like I'm from Malaysia I can tell you that it's another level one it's another level you have to be aware of what it's like all around the world mm. not that you can't complain or you can't you can you say can. about injustice, but please be aware of macro factors and you will be a much more effective paladin for change. Yeah. Or agent for change. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I reach for that. I play too many video games. Yeah. That's what I worry about also. But, but great video. Yeah. I think we can sum it up. Uh, let's, let's, let's wait for the next one, then we really dive into it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks, really. Yeah, paladin for change. Yes. <laughs>